morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barton in Washington. Today is Friday, January 27th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. M23 rebels want the international community to stop what they call genocide against Tutsis in DRC. We are seeking the help of the international community. We want the international community to act and to stop another genocide to happen in the Great Lake region of Africa. A bomb blast injures at least 18 in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo city of Goma. Tanzania's opposition holds their first rallies in six years after ban was lifted. The U.S. Embassy in South Sudan's capital condemns attacks on aid workers. We renew our call for South Sudan's leaders to act with urgency to end subnational violence and to hold accountable those responsible for attacks targeting civilians and humanitarian organizations. And with a new deep sea port, Nigeria's focus turns to better roads and rail. Those stories plus Samson O'Malley's posts are coming up on Daybreak Africa. M23 rebels operating in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo are defending their new offensive that has displaced over 450 people in Kishanga town. In their latest press release, the group blames the international community for paying lip service to what it calls genocide being committed against Congolese Tutsis by the Democratic Republic of Congo Army and its ally, the FDLR rebels. This comes as the United Nations peacekeeping mission in the country Monusco Thursday called on the M23 to cease all hostilities and withdraw from occupied areas. Lawrence Mukanya is the political spokesperson for the rebels. He tells me the M23 had no other option but to intervene in Kishanga to stop what he calls another genocide in the Great Lakes region of Africa. It's dreadful to see a UN mission like MONESCO having the courage to speak about the peace process in the DRC. MONESCO has been in the DRC for over 20 years. When it came in the DRC, we had four or five armed groups. But today we have over 250 groups under the MONESCO supervisions. The M23 never attacked any position of the coalitions. The M23 has released many communiques and went to the media, made a lot of noise, and let the world know that it has been attacked all the time by the DRC government coalitions with the help of MONESCO and the missionary in total violations of mini summit of Luanda resolutions. So here we're calling on the MONESCO to reframe supporting the DRC government coalition in total violation of mini summit of Luanda. Do you have any evidence that MONUSCO is supporting the DRC government? Let me seize this opportunity to thank the leaders of the region for their effort to find peace in the DRC. The M23 has ended its position of Kibumba and Rumangabo to the due care of the Eastern African Community Regional Forces. The M23 still committed to implement the resolution derived from the mini summit of Luanda. At the same time, we ask the DRC government to also respect and implement the resolution of mini summit of Luanda, as these resolutions were meant for all parties, all the stakeholders to the conflict. I read your latest press release in which you made several references to genocide against Congolese Tutsi by the government in Kinshasa. Is this part of your motivation for fighting? We have been calling on the international community to intervene and stop this ongoing genocide against the Congolese Tutsi perpetrated by the DRC government through its coalition of FDLR, Mai Mai, and Kodekos. Why blame the international community? We are not condemning the international community as such. We are seeking the help of the international community. We want the international community to act and to stop another genocide to happen 
in Great Lake region of Africa. Lawrence Mukanya is the political spokesperson for the M23 rebels. He was speaking with me from the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. In the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, at least 18 people were injured in a recent bomb blast in the market. The explosion took place in the evening in a cassava flour mill building in the middle of a market in the town of Beni. Zaneb Neti Zaide has details. The bomb apparently was in a green bag. A man left in the market Wednesday evening. This boy, Kasereka Shema, was hit by the shrapnel of the bomb. He says an unknown man arrived and dropped a bag where they were, saying he would pick it up shortly, less than five minutes after he left the bomb exploded. Pierre Viacuno, coordinator of the Savel Society of Mulekera Commune, talks about the aftermath of the explosion. He says they recorded more than 18 people injured, including three seriously injured and taken to the general hospital. After initial investigations, the security services and the United Nations Mine Action Service have not said say what kind of bomb it was. Katembo Tarsis is the chief of the neighborhood where the bomb exploded. He says after checking, they found that is really a bomb. He calls the population to be vigilant because the current security situation is not good. Any suspect in the area must be reported to the authorities. This blast comes a week after an explosion in the Protestant church of Kasindi on the border with Uganda killed 16 people. The Islamic State's militants claimed responsibility for that attack. Zanem Nechizaidi in Goma for VOA Africa. Reuters news agency says France is recalling its ambassador to Burkina Faso one day after Paris said it would withdraw its troops from the country. A statement by the French foreign ministry says that Ambassador Luke Halliday would take part in consultations on the state and perspectives of our bilateral cooperation. France said yesterday that it would withdraw its troops next month after Burkina Faso's military leader, Ibrahim Traore, asked them to leave. About 400 French special forces have been helping to fight an Islamic insurgency there since 2018. Recent attacks on humanitarian workers and their compounds in which three workers were killed. Deng Gai Deng has the story for VOA from Boa. The U.S. Embassy condemns in the strongest terms the recent targeted attacks on humanitarian workers and their compounds in South Sudan, including those that have led to the deaths of three South Sudanese humanitarian workers and injury to others. That's Colin Machado, the acting public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Juba in pre-recorded audio provided to South Sudan in focus by the embassy. Machado says the South Sudan government should hold the perpetrators accountable. He adds the U.S. government would like to see the action taken as soon as possible in order to safeguard the lives of civilians and humanitarian workers as well as their property. We renew our call for South Sudan's leaders to act with urgency to end subnational violence and to hold accountable those responsible for attacks targeting civilians and humanitarian organizations, as well as for abductions and other human rights violations. Machado says the U.S. Embassy stands with all those who work for peace and stability in South Sudan. On Monday, the U.N.'s acting humanitarian coordinator in South Sudan, Peter Van Der Awarat, also condemned last Wednesday attack on humanitarian workers and U.N. assets in Pibor of the Greater Pibor Administrative Area. Last Wednesday, several armed attackers broke into an international NGO compound in Pibor and beat up one humanitarian worker who eventually required medical attention. The UN humanitarian agency said the attackers targeted the NGO looking for catch and other assets. The UN said the perpetrators stole valuables but did not state what they were. The attackers killed two aid workers in the Abia administrative area and another aid worker in Jonglei state. No one has been arrested. 
South Sudan Information Minister Michael McQuay says he's attending the RJMEC meeting and could not respond at this time. Van der Awara said such attacks on humanitarians who provide critical services to the most vulnerable people are beyond comprehension, adding the ongoing violent attacks against humanitarians inadvertently hamper the, the delivery of the much-needed life-saving support to millions of people affected in times of escalating conflict. The UN official says protecting humanitarian workers and civilians is the duty of South Sudanese authorities. Van der Awarad says the humanitarian community is calling on authorities to do everything in their power to stop attacks on humanitarians and civilians and quickly bring the perpetrators to justice. It says ending impunity and ensuring accountability goes hand in hand with protecting humanitarians and civilians and bringing long-term peace to South Sudan. According to the UN, South Sudan is one of the most dangerous places for aid workers, with nine humanitarian workers killed in the line of duty and 450 incidents reported in 2022, and already three humanitarian workers killed in 2023. The UN estimates 9.4 million of the most vulnerable people in South Sudan will need hygiene life-saving assistance and protection in 2023. That compares to 8.9 million in 2022. For VOA News, I am Deng Gaiding in Bor. Tanzania's opposition Chadema party held its first public rally in six years this week after the government lifted a ban on such gatherings. Despite the restored right to rally, critics doubt Tanzania's party of the revolution, the second longest ruling party in Africa, will stop squeezing opponents and say legal changes are needed. Charles Kumbe reports from Dar es Salaam. <laughs> Tanzania's opposition party for democracy and progress, known as Chadema, celebrates the lifting of six-year ban on their rallies, which the government said were a security concern. The party's Deputy Secretary General Benson Kigaila says during the ban, the state often targeted their members and supporters. The political environment was hard. Many people were arrested, and we had a lot of trumped-up cases. People were detained and tortured. In short, there were a lot of bad things that were done. Rest groups say the late former president of Tanzania, Johnny Magufuli, cracked down on critics. Since his death in 2021, President Samia Sulu Hassan has vowed a more open political space, including this month's lifting of the ban on political rallies. Our responsibility is to protect you to hold political rallies peacefully, finish well, and leave safely. That's our responsibility as the government. Your responsibility as a political party is to follow the laws and regulations. The chairman of Chadema, Freeman Bowie, spent seven months in jail on terrorism charges before the prosecution in March dropped the case. He says President Hassan's lifting the ban and meeting with opposition members makes him optimistic about the future. I congratulate Her Excellency, President Samia Hassan, on the way she agreed with our suggestions as Chadema during our meetings. She said to me, Honorable Boe, let's find a way and a tradition of agreeing with each other. This president agreed with what I suggested to her on behalf of all the Chadema supporters, and yet there are some people who want me to insult her. I will never do that. But Chadema and rights activists say... Tanzania's president needs to move forward with reforming the constitution and laws so rights cannot be taken away by decree. Statements from leaders most of the time are not a good way to lead any democratic country. So to ensure this right continues, we must have laws because if we wait and depend on the president or the ruling party's decision, we will not be moving forward in democracy. If we move by what the laws are saying, it will help this right to continue to be applied well in our country. Meanwhile, Tanzania's opposition plans to take full advantage of the ban being lifted, with rallies planned all over the country. Charles Kombe, for VA News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania.
A Kenyan court has found a Venezuelan diplomat guilty of murdering the country's acting ambassador 10 years ago in her home. Reuters news agency says the court found the former first secretary at the Venezuela embassy, Dwight Sagari, guilty of killing Olga Fonseca in 2012. Three Kenyan nationals were also convicted for helping to carry out the murder. The wire service says another person who fled the scene is still at large. Fonseca was found strangled in her bedroom less than two weeks into her posting in Nigeria. The court found that Sangare, who had been heading the mission before her arrival, resented her presence and wanted to continue in his post. There was also evidence that he had tried to interfere with her ability to take over as head of the embassy before she was killed. Nigerian authorities have hailed the launch of a deep water seaport in Lagos they say will create 300,000 jobs and reduce shipping bottlenecks. While the new port is expected to reduce losses due to congestion, shipping industry experts in Nigeria's poor roads and rail connections to ports also must be improved. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. The launch by President Mohamed Buhari during his two-day visit this week to Lagos signaled his government's effort to grow Nigeria's economy through infrastructural development. The $1.5 billion Chinese-built Lekki Deep Sea Port sits on 90 hectares of land in the Lagos Free Trade Zone, the biggest port by size in West Africa. Authorities say ships docking at the port could be up to four times the size of vessels at the state's Tinkan and Apapa ports. They expect it will ease delays and congestion at ports and increase earnings by up to $360 billion in coming years. Ifuita Ephraim is a manager at Ports and Terminal Nigeria Limited. The current ports we have in the country are sited or located along uh, rivers, tributaries, and that's why there are limitations. It's a welcome development you know, to have an, uh, an infrastructure of this nature in our country. With these, um, larger vessels will be able to berth at our ports, and um, we shall be in competition with our neighboring uh, countries such as uh, Cotonou here. Most of Nigeria's seaports were built many decades ago and are either closed or operating below capacity. Nigeria loses an estimated $1 billion a year to delays and bottlenecks at ports. To address the problem, the Nigerian Ports Authority launched an automated process for clearing cargo at ports. Abiodun Badamosi is the former general manager of Nigeria's western ports. He says the new deep seaport at Lagos will add to Nigeria's economic progress and create jobs. The country's Bureau of Statistics says Nigeria's unemployment rate is 33%. What Nigeria needs now are jobs, jobs, more jobs. That's what Nigeria needs now, and that's going to go a very, very long way. Uh, uh, it's going to um, improve the commerce around that area. And when you look at it, it's, it's, it's actually highly commendable, highly commendable. And it's going to actually propel the state. Then Nigeria can now push forward the idea of being a hub for the region. Ephraim says authorities must improve road and rail accessibility to the area. If uh, the items are to be conveyed out from the port and into the port by road, that I would expect that uh, multimodal mode of transportation should be encouraged, you know, to and from the Lekki Deep Sea Port. Rail, water, and road transportation. China is one of Nigeria's biggest lenders and has been funding rail, road, and power projects. The first commercial vessel is expected to arrive in the port this Sunday. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria.